and we are live. Hi and welcome to this live Q&A AMA Ask Me Anything session. And yeah, I'm very happy to do this again. Uh, actually, it has been a while and I would like to use this time to answer your questions, like any questions actually that you have uh, towards uh, me, like regarding technology, regarding Java, regarding, I don't know, coffee, motorcycles, whatever you would like to uh, you would like to know. And I was very happy to see that we actually uh, have uh, a lot or had a lot of uh, questions already. So um, I got a lot, uh, I got a lot of questions uh, via email up front and I put them into this uh, repo. And um, yeah, feel free to say uh, hi over the chat. Uh, Hola Hilmer. Super happy to, to see some uh, familiar faces. And you can also just say hi, you can say where you're from, where you're watching from. And of course, if you have any questions, put them into, I think that's over there for you, um, into the chat and uh, we will go uh, through them. So, so let me start out with just sharing what I put into this GitHub. I at first uh, always uh, start out with these things. So, you know, if I get something here via email, I put them in or of course you can comment there. And um, yeah, I got um, already a lot of uh, technical uh, uh, things and technical questions so we can start um, right away. Uh, first question here that I got via email. So already very technical, I like that. What do you think about uh, DDD, so domain driven design and specifically uh, hexagonal architecture. Um, well, what I think about, I'm actually a big fan. I think this is, uh, or I shouldn't say fan. I think um, it is very uh, useful in projects and very pragmatic um, to model software. So let's have a glance at uh, Wikipedia, of course, what that is. Uh, hexagonal architecture um, described in, well, a few actually different sources. Martin Fowler wrote about it, uh, Robert C. Martin. And um, specifically, you see uh, the structure here that we have um, the application core in the middle and especially our uh, domain logic um, in the middle, um, which is very much connected to the idea of domain driven uh, design uh, described in, the, uh, in that book. And um, it especially makes sense to, well, uh, focus on modeling that business uh, components, that core, and then uh, modeling all of these other adapters that basically will connect, I guess, uh, towards this um, towards this structure. Uh, why? Because of separations of concerns. Well, at the same time, we don't have any uh, unnecessary layers. So I have another question actually uh, here for uh, for you that I got uh, regarding uh, that. So I'm not a big uh, fan, or I don't think it makes sense to put in unnecessary layers, uh, but at the same time to care a lot about while well, crafting a core domain model that really makes sense for whatever you're trying to do, which is connected to here, the idea uh, behind domain driven design. So specifically to try to model, to craft something that is connected to the business domain, which, yeah, I know, of course, it sounds, it sounds obvious. It's, it's kind of logical, but it, there's really a point to say, Hey, what is the business use case like? Can we talk to the domain experts, to the non-technical domain experts? Can we talk to the user to really craft the core domain classes that match uh, the, our problem domain, what we want to model for? And uh, what I found uh, from experience, the more um, the more focus we put on that, especially first, right before we care about which framework, before we care about all of the connection, I don't know, the infrastructure, Kubernetes, um, HTTP databases, whatever, before just make sure that you get that modeling right, because it will help you a lot. It will make your uh, life easier afterwards. So I'm a very big fan uh, about that. And, or, or I think, you know, it, it is very useful uh, to just use that or to know about these, um, well, about these uh, structures or approaches. Um, how to learn more about this, specifically Domain Driven Design. There is a book that is named uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric uh, Evans. And it is definitely not a very easy read. I, I mean, I was kind of uh, fighting my way through it back then when I wrote it, uh, read it the first time, but it is totally worth it. So I can, uh, I can just recommend to give it a try to read it and then also take some notes at the sides and you know after every chapter just uh, or um, highlight and mark the most important things you will learn a lot of uh, important uh, stuff there if you're interested uh, into uh, in this topic i actually gave uh, a presentation or a few presentations 
uh, about this in, in the past, specifically from a perspective of a effective developer, quote unquote, of a pragmatic approach, because with design and architecture, we very often go into over engineering. And um, yeah, that's uh, like basically what to focus on for developers to be pragmatic. So there are some uh, there are some material here and you can watch this recording to get the links actually. Um, you can have a look at the code and there was a recorded talk at the latest one I found uh, that I gave was DevOps Ukraine 2019 actually gave me memories back then when we were at conferences in person. Yeah, that was yeah, a long time ago, it feels like. And um, yeah, I was just showing, you know, a few examples from this perspective that also covers uh, some of the concepts behind domain driven design. You might be interesting in, uh, interested in that. Uh, either you see it here just you know what to search for uh, in the video you can also watch the recording later and um, yeah maybe maybe that's for you so let's have a look into uh, the chat so we have a bunch of questions already so what do you think about the future of Java uh, server faces um, server side technologies uh, will be popular again so yes, uh, Java server faces, well, these are two questions, basically, uh, Java server faces, JSF. Um, I, in, in the last years, I always uh, said the following opinion. So sometimes it is actually still used. I don't see JSF as a thing like, oh, is it, you know, still modern? Should we use it? No, for me, it was always a different criteria. Does it make sense for your approach? What JSF still enables you to do is to very pragmatically um, build um, build some pages, some sites, uh, for example, some controls or some dashboards um, very rapidly that just look, let me say, in a certain way, right? So what it does, you have predefined components that you can, you know, put together very, very efficiently. And, you know, it's, it's actually very fast to, uh, to craft up JSF pages. What is, uh, it's not, it's not the latest um, frame, um, front end framework approaches, you know, and latest fanciest stylistic uh, elements and whatever. So where JSF really makes sense still is for somewhat admin backend pages, like backend in terms of, you know, that's not really user facing, more like something like a management uh, side, like, you know, some, some back office type of thing. Um, where you know uh, users don't care that much that it's the latest look where it's actually more like pragmatic and then it's really efficient to use it. If you have to change anything or if you want to change anything from that perspective, how it should look about the styling about you know extra feature, then you very very quickly go into this area where it's like hey it's actually more pragmatic to choose a different technology. And uh, that is still uh, the case from my experience. Then the second uh, question that you have is about um, server-side technologies. So that's a different story because server-side technologies or server-side rendering of pages covers much, much more. And it also covers, well, server-side rendering as it always was with, you know, even JSPs. I mean, please don't laugh. Actually, it's a very pragmatic and unusable uh, technology. Or what we would use with uh, Quarkus is uh, Quarkus uh, Qt, for example. So there is this Qt rendering uh, engine written like um, this. Uh, if you use Quarkus, for example, so this is um, actually a quite um, new rendering or a, a specific rendering engine just for Quarkus, which uh, I'm using uh, now all the time when I use Quarkus for server-side rendering that does exactly this. It's actually very pragmatic to include from a um, backend perspective. So it's an action-based MVC and um, then it renders your HTML and the HTML is delivered to the browser. So, you know, very kind of old fashioned if you want, but it's extremely pragmatic. It's a very good approach to do server side rendering in this way. It's mostly, you know, what you need at least 90% of the time. And uh, you can take it from there. Another example would be MVC. So there's a Java EE or now Jakarta EE standard also for action based um, MVC, which is a little bit similar to, you know, if you would take something like JAXRS or Spring REST controllers and then forward it to a template. So you can do that as well. You can do a similar um, approach with Spring if you have some other templates and include that uh, there, for example. And that's um, a very pragmatic approach. So actually, I would always consider that first if you do some, you know, rendering on that side for any project. So that's still, you know, very modern or timeless if you want or pragmatic, uh, I should say. And yeah, 
some more questions. Hola, Sebastian. Hola, Hilma. About design patterns, principles, which of them have you used and consider more useful? Um, I can point to this talk that I just showed because especially when you say, okay, which I um, consider useful uh, and pragmatic, then let me, um, I don't know what to sh uh, show f uh, first. I will, uh, no, that's a different computer. I will copy that into, uh, into the chat and also uh, here this page and you can uh, find the, uh, the slides in the project, but you might want to watch the, uh, the talk um, or something like that. Um, to see which one I consider um, actually the most uh, useful. It's the same with um, design principles in general besides CDD. Uh, what I in general always think is the most useful is abstraction and a delegation and separation of concerns. So in my eyes, these are the most important principles in IT in general. So, you know, just the fact that my mom can use a computer is because of abstraction. You know, you abstracted all of the details in such a way that it's literally only a button click uh, left, which you have to do. Um, and we do the same in software, right? We abstract details with proper abstractions, hopefully. We separate uh, concerns um, by usually using delegation and things like that, which I explained in that uh, talk. So I think that's the you know most uh, helpful ones. And um, should I use JSF for startups? We plan to develop larger ERP system. Um, I would actually say yes, why not? Uh, why I say that specifically for startups, not in a perspective of, of what is new and cool, but from a perspective of, of what is pragmatic and what is very efficient. Why? Because startups, um, you know, actually have to care about uh, their money and, you know, how to work efficiently. They don't have any endless money supply as some big corporations do, and they have to see, okay, what is the pragmatic and most efficient ap approach that gets us forward, forward, which I really like that way of thinking. And um, if the layout and what the specific JSF, um, like prime faces or whatever you use, uh, offers for you, if that works for you for that system that you're building, yes, then definitely go for it. Why? Because it's a very pragmatic approach to build, you know, somewhat complex uh, dashboards and, and structures, control structures like you would have in an EAP system. And um, that's, that's definitely, I, I would definitely consider that approach, yes. So you just have to see into the specific if it works out for what you're planning to do. Uh, but other than that, yes, I would um, actually give that a try. All right, a lot of questions today, that's super cool. Hi, which Java test frameworks do you like to use? Um, like to use, that's very easy. Why JUnit? Uh, why JUnit? Because I'm used to JUnit and the syntax and most of most of most of, most of Java developers are. Um, I actually heard that some developers are more uh, happy with TestNG, but I mean, these are basically the big, two big ones, um, which I'm fine with, right? If, if you're happy with that, use whatever you use. Um, I mostly um, use JUnit for that reason that people are, um, that people are uh, used to it. This plus um, Mokito typically in a somewhat recent version and assert J for assertions. Let me point you to, I have some material on that as well. Effective testing, I just, yeah, thoughts on effective testing and there's also a, a video course that I have, video course. They, they are very similar in the uh, in the contents, it depends what you uh, what you actually just enjoy consuming. So this is an article uh, that I wrote in six parts that um, show you uh, go guide you for uh, through different uh, materials and also about the test uh, frameworks and technologies and the same for the video uh, course here. So why? Let me quickly browse uh, browse through here um, just until like part five or something like this. I think it is. Um, workflow, of course, if you read it, then I advise you to read all of it properly, not, not like I'm doing here. Yes. So here I'm share, uh, sharing my view, JUnit, SRJ, Mokito. That's typically these magical three that I use. Why these? Um, JUnit, because it's super fast and super simple. It's reliable. People know it. And it's actually sufficient for most of most of things that you're doing, because especially if you get into a more complex project setup, Mostly what you lack, what you are lacking, what you're searching for are not more test frameworks, but actually proper code quality, proper test code structures that help you make your code more maintainable. 
So for example, if you have reusable things that you always do in your hundreds, um, hundreds of test uh, suites or uh, test cases, then what you should do is craft the delegates and, you know, delegate, use proper abstraction levels, um, uh, levels and layers, what we talked about earlier. And that makes you actually more um, effective in, in crafting these tests. It's not necessarily the test frameworks. So that's actually uh, my point on that and why I think JUnit is um, sufficient for most of it. And then anything on top of it is mostly from my eyes, just, you know, some something like syntactical sugar. If you like, um, for example, Spock with uh, with a groovy syntax, or you like, you know, another uh, alternative JVM language. If you're a Kotlin person, you know, it's it's fine to put that on top of it. But especially if you look into a complex project, a complex setup, the more you know complex your project uh, gets, the more important actually it is to care about these test code structures, to care about proper test design, and not which language or which framework you're using. So this is my take on that. Um, there's actually a reason why I'm mostly not using um, some other test technology that actually starts up things for me, like test containers, like a Quarkus test with the you know test driver, like Spring test. It's all you know similar idea. Why? Um, if you're interested in that, then definitely go check out this material uh, that's available for free, um, because I think you're much more efficient, or I claim you're much more efficient. Um, if you separate the life cycles, if you say, okay, I have a test set up that I'm not starting each and every time, or, you know, where I don't have to wait uh, for it each and every time, what you're doing, you're tangling the life cycle of your test environment of your and of your test run. And this um, is, is not the most effective way. It's actually faster in the long run during your workflow, during your coding session to start it up once, keep it running, and then uh, use your tests in a different way. If you're interested in that, uh, check out that material. I think that would be a little bit uh, too much otherwise, or uh, feel free to ask another uh, question. But that's the reason why I'm actually just keep it with these test technologies. Um, sometimes there are some other ones. I sometimes use a Cucumber a test with Gherkin syntax just to make non-technical uh, uh, business folks uh, happier if they you know, develop there as well and they're, if they're not that happy reading Java code. But other than that, it's really about the code quality and you know, proper naming, proper structuring of tests. Then you, you can be super happy with Java and plain JUnit. You actually don't need uh, anything else. It's, it's really about the approach. Um, opinion about Golang. Um, yes, actually I have very little experience with, uh, with Golang. Also just uh, from the fact that all of my projects actually I should not say most but actually all of my projects now are somewhat connected to Java um, my and that's you know what I what I now say is really my personal opinion and I cannot 100% speak for every aspect of go because I'm not that experienced there but from what I see it is a very pragmatic language for something like infrastructure uh, for more I don't want to say low level uh, but um, any details where you really need the the um, aspect that is a little bit closer to the hardware where you need higher performance, where you want that native build. Um, so um, Kubernetes and Docker, uh, for example, are written in Go. And if you would write some operators, I know you can also do this in Java, but from all of that infrastructure perspective, it's you know a little bit of a different world to, than to the typical uh, Java business world in which I'm mostly in and probably most of you are mostly in, uh, is that this is then, um, you know, might be more effective to to use Go for business perspectives and for business applications. I actually, and of course, I'm biased and I'm a Java guy and Java champion. But I think Java is a more a pragmatic language because also of of the syntax. It's very nicely readable. It's not you know the most um, I don't know most powerful language in the world, but actually for a good reason. I, I think for me that's a plus to make it really understandable. Uh, from from that regard and it has been around uh, much longer than go has so from from this perspective for business applications It's just perfect and that's why I why I use Java and also if you're really um, interested into uh, Lower latency fast startup then have a look into Quarkus and specifically uh, Graal VM um, then you actually can write um, Kubernetes operators and uh, compile them down to natively uh, with Quarkus and uh, you can write, you know, even some command line applications and um, compile them down natively. Why? Because a JVM usually takes a long time to start up and with long time, I mean something like a few 
uh, milliseconds, a few hundred milliseconds maybe, but uh, in a command line application, it really does make a difference and then you might want to use um, this this hack. So in the past, I would I would have said use you know Go or something else for that, but now you can you know also write it in Java and then com compile it down. So um, that's that's my take on that. How do you exp um, how do you expand alias on Z shell? I can answer that right away. I actually wrote well a bunch of things uh, on that alias Z shell. This one. It's actually described how I do this because I explain here I have multiple type of aliases. Some I want to expand, some I don't. And this um, describes how you make this in Z shell and make it expandable. So search for this article. And I also have uh, whatever I think linked my dot files somewhere. Uh, if not, then you can search for my name dot files. And I'm pretty sure you will end up yes on GitHub somewhere. Well, it actually should go to the dot files directory. Well, you can search also here for dot files, <laughs> and then you will find them. There we go. And yeah, there's also a video course uh, on on this on the effective keyboard usage. Keyboard usage. Oh, there we go. Google is your friend. For that also shows this and a, a bunch of other command line tricks. So if you're if you're a command line person or um, like myself, then you might want to check that out. That's definitely a cool, uh, cool content here. There we go. Um, next question. We have a lot of questions here today. That's super cool. Uh, like I type something like di, then tap it expands the Docker images. Yes, exactly. That's the uh, aliases. Um, yes, you can have that. Um, there, hi Sebastian. I watch your series about event sourcing and CQRS. Do you think the transaction outbox pattern, the BCM, is to prefer over publishing messages directly to Kafka? Yes, I think so. Uh, why? Because it's more, um, uh, it's more tested, and you know, it's um, it's an approach that has been out there, or you know, has been verified uh, uh, more than if you if you would do it yourself. And the BCM is actually very very interesting uh, projects, and uh, I know the people behind it. It's it's very cool. Um, there to to try it out. Let's see if bzm.io or something like this. You can. Uh, oh. My video setup doesn't want now. Uh, dbzm. Here you can check this out. That's uh, very interesting. Yes, supports all kinds of databases. But I guess if you ask the question, you you know that the database you want to use is is probably supported by that. Super cool. Um, thank you. What do you think about karate for testing? I have to admit, I don't know. I haven't heard that name. So let's, let's check it out together. I literally searched for it the same at uh, the first time. Intuit karate test automation made simple. Let's have a look at it uh, together. So what it does is an open source tool, API test uh, automation, marks, performance testing, UI automation. Okay, interesting. Oh, BDD syntax. Okay, this looks very similar to uh, Cucumber and Gherkin syntax. Uh-huh. Okay, interesting. So I would need to look into it how how much actually you know you can do with it. The first um when I see this. Um, I mean, no offense, I'm pretty sure it's a very nice, uh, nice project, but I think this is not the best example to show to people why I, I see this quite often when you read articles or watch stuff about testing, then, you know, here you see, hello world, create cat, you know, do this post here, check where, where the status code is like this. And sometimes I do this in my code as a somewhat negative example. Why? Because you're mixing aspects here. This is what I talked about uh, with abstraction layers, that if you, let's say you want to create a cat, whatever that means, and retrieve a cat, then at first you should say, please create cat with this name, I guess, and then, you know, retrieve cat and check whether name equals Billy. And 
that's it. And the, oh, um, the, the underlying details that create ca a cat quote unquote means do an HTTP post to this location and then check whether status equals this and this, that should be in a different layer. Why? Because if you have 300s of these type of tests, and then of course what happens, you change your API or you know something uh, changes from that structure, from that technical perspective, you're screwed because you have to change 200 tests. So what you should do instead, craft some um, specific layer specific abstraction that is specific for your project which means you create something in java it would be a method you know create cat and then retrieve cat from the underlying system and only that perspective and, and that other uh, component has the perspective of, of what means uh, to create a cat in this case do an http whatever and I, i'm pretty sure that is possible with this technology as well i'm not saying that this doesn't support it I, or i don't know but just from when i see examples like this this is not the you know nicest example to show to people why it you know the, the way how you read it first of all it's very nice that you say it says readable syntax sure but then if the readable syntax means you have to know a lot about technology if i give this to a non-technical person like a domain expert who knows about cats and names and whatever but who does not know anything about http status codes and json and things like that then well, this doesn't help much because then the person reads what is method post, what is status 201, what, why not 200, right? You know, they, they would not know. And you have to craft this into a lower abstraction layer. So that's just a comment on this. Um, you know, it looks very nice, first of all, but um, uh, just as an example, I don't think that's the best you know, way to, to show to developers. So it, it looks a little bit to me that it's a somewhat overarching technology that you know, will build up uh, a lot of things which sounds pretty cool. It's just the question is how much, you know, how flexible it is. And again, this is, I, I'm, I don't know anything about that project. I literally hear it the first time. This is just my first glance over it. Um, let me just quickly, you know, here it's the same about the scenario. I mean, it's nice that you can read this, uh, that you can write this in a readable way. But if you say, you know, scenario when t method get, well, you know, then I can also write Java code equals get whatever, right? So then we're already technical. You have no gain by writing it's human readable, quote unquote. Um, so you have to be able and, uh, you know, it can be used. I'm pretty sure it can be used in a very nice way. If you are able to actually, yeah, cucumber. Um, if you're able to craft lower level details, lower level abstraction delegates. So um, actually, I was um, I'm explaining this in uh, not this one in to me uh, things open in this video course and also this uh, longer uh, blog post article series why we should do this in this way. And then um, I'm pretty sure this uses cucumber here. Then you can also use cucumber in this way. But then I would not write this. I would write, you know, scenario test. Well, user is a bad example, but um, scenario here, create cat name Billy, then retrieve cat, e check if, na uh, if name equals Billy. That would be um, a test from a use case perspective, from a user perspective. The user doesn't care about HTTP and JSON. So we have to separate that. Um, and then the rest, I, you know, it's, it, it looks a little bit too big to, to look at it uh, just here in a second. Looks like a somewhat uh, overarching uh, framework. And then for me, the question would really be how flexible it is. Because typically what I do, I'm actually still very happy with this approach. I usually write bash scripts to fire up my test environment. And this is, you know, the most pragmatic approach I, I know. And it's usually Docker run three times or something like that. Or you can use Docker compose, whatever. And then you run your, your system test or whatever that means. So um, for me, that's just more pragmatic. But in any way, the, uh, the abstraction part, this is why I'm really saying this multiple times. This is really important just in order to stay maintainable and productive. Um, all right, so a lot, a lot now for, for testing. And yeah, how do you suggest learning software architecture and design as a beginner? I'm a fourth uh, year computer science grad. Super cool that you study computer science. I did that too. Um, learning software architecture and design. There are a few, wait a second, a few books that I can recommend because they helped me. Um, these are also on this uh, article here. So these ones, that's actually the same talk that I gave and some you know, of the resources that helped me. Um, why? Because when I always, uh, and this is why I actually back then gave this talk on you know, 
design principles for the effective developer so you know how to be pragmatic because with and this is especially you know it can be especially helpful to you if you if you're starting out um also in an academic perspective very often it's you know it's it's too over engineered you know oh you have to learn about all of these design principles and decorate a pattern and whatnot do you want to know how many times i used to decorate a pattern in my i don't know how many years i'm now in this job well anyway the answer is zero not a single time i mean if you're building a framework or a very complex product, it might be different. If you're, you know, building something like Spring, of course, you know, that's a different story. But for most uh, enterprise applications or, you know, user-facing applications for most products that you're building, um, that is actually totally um, uh, this non, non-effective, this... Uh, I'm lacking an English word now. It, it's the wrong way. It's actually, uh, you know, it's a bad... Uh, bad approach why because it it's actually too confusing uh, people uh, other people if you're working with a team they like easy code easy and clear understandable uh, structures and you know the easier it is and the less um and the less over engineered it is the better if uh, you look into uh, these these works for example especially domain driven design this really explains how to craft something from a um, use case perspective from a domain perspective and it can be very pragmatic very simple and at the same time using all of these object oriented so this is mostly about object oriented structures uh, principles uh, behind that to be really pragmatic with this and this you know helped uh, helped me a lot actually all of these books but especially domain driven design and um, java by comparison that's specifically about java but what i liked really liked in this book was it shows you side by side two different approaches and then a somewhat best practice quote unquote why one approach is better and especially if you start out this is the most important thing that always helped me once you understand why it is better then it really clicked and then you will be a better you know a slightly be- a better programmer why because so many people use best practices, quote unquote, best practices, only for the sake of using best practices. But they would say, well, everybody does it, right? Or it's meant to be this way. But once you understood why sometimes it does make sense and why sometimes it doesn't, then you can actually use it and say, hey, look, I'm not only using it to be according to the book or according to the craft or who, whoever said it, but actually because of these reasons, it does make sense. So it makes the code more readable or whatever it is. And um, that is really something to to understand. I don't have an ultimate answer uh, for that, unfortunately, but these are things that help me and especially just, you know, programming, just getting experience uh, there. And especially if you use it in, in, um, during studies, that's perfect because, you know, you, you have time, you can take a project and really say, I take the time to look, is there some different approach? And you will try out, I guarantee you, five different approaches and most of them you throw away. But that's not bad, that's good, because then you learn something, you tried it out, say, oh, why not model it in a different way? And then you see why it doesn't make sense. And this is how you get the experience of saying, hey, wait wait a second, this actually makes sense or not for this and this reasons. And then you, you know, you get you get a much better feeling in which direction to go usually. And this is this is what I would uh w- would recommend. All right. Yeah, thanks to you for the question. For event-driven applications, how would you create a corresponding reactive front-end and how would you send events to the client? How would you use a polling system, long, short, or server send events? Um, how would I use them? Well, a single, a simple answer, it depends on the use case. Like, really, I mean, it sounds like a stupid answer, but um, with a polling system or uh, server send events, so server send events, I'm actually somewhat a fan. Why? Because they're very pragmatic and uh, they're supported and um, also Java E and Quark is and uh, Spring as far as I know for like a long time and um, they're just you know pragmatic if you want to send some updates. Um, it depends a little bit from this perspective that if you really really want to be fully consistent quote unquote that, you, that the user always sees their super consistent data then you might actually be easier just to you know like have some uh, more uh, request response approach and reload and stuff like that. So it, it depends, you know, because the devil lays in the detail there. But if you say it should be a pragmatic approach, something like a ticker update or some stat update, where if it's lagging behind, sometimes it's, you know, not 100%, it's not a big deal, um, uh, then it, it really depends on the use case, what is the most uh, appropriate. So typically, um, what I've been doing in this way is just, you know, to have a site that just stays open, that uh, will not be refreshed in the browser. And then, you know, you have some 
uh, asynchronous event uh, coming in. So that would be, well, you can also use WebSockets or service and events where you're just waiting and you will be notified on a, on a message. Or of course, you know, depends on what makes sense. You have a, um, a static page that doesn't get reloaded as well. And you have a JavaScript polling mechanism or something that actively pulls for an update, which is easier on the backend side, then you don't have to care uh, necessarily care about uh, the async thing on the backend because your JavaScript from a uh, front end will uh, will pull. Um, yeah, I can say more like really it depends what is easier from the overall perspective, like how much you control the front end and, and backend code, and actually what you want to do. So what the use case is in, uh, in terms of well, what happens if the user doesn't look at the site for uh, for a long time or you know shuts on the computer or puts it you know closes the lid and then starts again how should it behave in this way with so with service and events you can be quite consistent there that you say please keep up for the latest events that you didn't get and things like that and resubmit uh, them um, so you know you can build pretty cool stuff with it um, the only um, advice i would give from experience don't, don't make don't make it too complicated if you don't have to be like so sometimes you know this goes sometimes into the over engineering part where we're like oh we can do everything you know asynchronous and, and stuff like that and you're like yeah but you could also reload the page or you know because a lot of things can be really more effective in a, in a different way as well so it just depends what uh what makes sense there but these are um the things that i would look into probably even again depending on the approach uh, service and event before WebSockets because it's uh, like easier to con consume. Uh, with WebSockets, you can do whatever you like. That's that's very uh, powerful. All right, super cool. A lot of uh, questions today. I love that. Um, next question in the chat, and then it, uh, we will go through uh, the GitHub ones, of course, as well. I'm really struggling to understand the Java programming language. Uh, me too, since more than ten years <laughs> in the forum. Or is it? Uh, or is it developed by deployed by Twitter? Most of leading Java books I found are 20 years old. Please give some advice. Um, yeah, most of leading Java books uh, are 20 years old. No, not uh, definitely not all of them. So what I showed here, this one, for example, functional programming in Java uh, by my friend Venkat um, is uh, one that shows everything that uh, came with um, lambdas and streams in Java 8. So I know Java 8 is also a few years old, but that shows, um, you know, all of that uh, perspective. And um, then also from, let me read your, your comment. And then with, with regards to that, it's actually really more about the, the concepts and, and principles uh, that you, you're using. Um, especially, you know, we talked a lot about design today and um, it did not change that much uh, in these regards uh, from that perspective uh, in the last years. What some, um, you know, with one exception, maybe a different programming model such as uh, reactive um, because that, you know, changes a lot the threading perspective of, of what you do. Uh, but other than that, many, many things still behave in a in the same way. Um, so they are definitely... Um, uh, changes and actually now uh, in, in Java and now uh, Java advances much much faster and more more frequent uh, than before with I don't even are we 15 16 already something like that JDK um, version uh, with a lot of you know now smaller but a lot of new features which is actually uh, actually cool but for resources yeah I um I said this now many times I actually can you know these books well shameless plug this is my book uh, but especially domain driven design with regards to uh, maybe java by comparison it's also because i specifically asked for java uh, a good example with regards to modeling and thinking about what is it actually that i would like to solve right so even if i look into a book that's 20 years old well i mean who cares right there's database technology um, out there with uh, asset transaction that these aspects are you know super old actually and um if you can build pragmatic solutions to a problem, I mean, who cares, right, about the how, how old a language is? Actually, Python and JavaScript, uh, you know, the more hype languages are actually older uh, than Java. Um, but again, it's, you know, just about pragmatic approaches. And I think I would focus more on, you know, the modeling aspect, how to read comprehensible and maintain, uh, sorry, how to write comprehensible and maintainable code and you know how to model the thing really my problem situation into code and make it understandable 
right? And it's really not about using the latest language feature or not, uh, at least from uh, from my perspective. I um, I hope that was helpful. Another question, is the CQRS journey of Microsoft good? If you're referring to the same one that I was reading back then, yes. So I now CQRS Microsoft. I think that was the, uh, the same. So back then when I actually learned about CQRS the first time, I had a lot of resources from Microsoft and they were, yes, it looks it looks similar. It's It's really quite a while ago or a few years now, but I think, yes, if, if, if you're referring to that, otherwise you can also feel free to post a link. Um, but if you're referring to, you know, like these type of descriptions under Microsoft, they were really, um, really helpful to me. And I, um, you know, understood them, uh, like thanks to them, understood it uh, very well from that approach perspective. So, you know, when I first saw those Microsoft documentation pages, I thought, okay, maybe they're trying to sell me the .NET approach or whatever, but it was actually very, um, uh, very disconnected from the technology in a good way that it really makes you understand the patterns and the architecture first. It doesn't talk uh, about .NET or you know any specific solution. is really about the pattern. So I, I can totally uh, recommend them. I, I learned a lot from these pages, and um, and yeah. So another question in the chat: What is your distro on Linux? Yes, I'm a big Linux fan. I use um, Arch Linux with an i3 window manager, it's Arch Linux. With that, the reason why Arch Linux, well, that is just historical reasons because I used it back in my um, uh, in my studies. And as a student, you have more time to play around with your system. I wouldn't uh, recommend to start out with that uh, necessarily, but I'm a big Linux uh, fan. And i3 is this uh, window manager, which I actually can use to you know very efficiently uh, jump around the windows. So now I just got used to it and I really, you know, need, as you saw, I didn't use my mouse. Um, I really need that in order to be efficient. So that is that is my specific uh, specific setup. All right, I would say let's have a look at these questions here, because we, yeah, we oh we actually stopped here somewhat. Yes, actually, um, this is remaining in all of these. And again, of course, if you have some further questions, please put them into the chat. So do you model, um, it was about DDD and its architecture. Do you model your domain entities and aggregates? Uh, yes, um, I mean, uh, if it makes sense for the domain, but yes, actually that, that really happens. Um, so again, uh, if you're wondering what is an entity, what is an aggregate, I can really recommend to um, you know look into domain-driven design or at least look into this, uh, this talk and uh, thing that I shared. Um, and um, yeah, I had it a few times where it makes sense uh, to model something as an aggregate. And why? Uh, because specifically for persistence, um, if you have something like JPA or any other ORM or OGM uh, framework, um, then it makes uh, things you know very consistent very easily if you always take the root aggregate uh, object, that root entity, and put all uh, persistence operations on that and cascade them down. Uh, and you know then you're very very consistent very easily you know you usually don't have to worry about oh did i remove this reference from that object and things like that um and this is a reason why it's, it's really helpful do you have a separate business and persistence model so that the business model is free from framework specific 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 annotations and contains independent pojos no usually not at least in more than 99 percent of the cases uh why because in most of the cases it is not required or in other words if you separate something just for the sake of separating and at the end you will build it build it together anyway and it will be a single deployment artifact then there is no point so um because you know at the end you will end up with with one thing anyway and you make life more complicated because then you have se uh, separate models which are typically at least separate maven modules or Gradle uh, modules or you know different projects or something like that and then you have to import them uh, you have to make sure that they're up to date and of course all of that is possible but it just require um, you know it adds more effort for I say no no reason so in the first approach I would always actually take one core business model and you know put whatever annotation on it um, if you want if, if sometimes it does not make sense because it doesn't match 
because for example, you would like to output it via JSON as well. And then, you know, the output is different. Well, if it's different, then it's a different story. Then you actually craft a different model. But if the only reason why you have two models is just for, you know, the sake of separ separating them uh, for the sake of architecture, that's not a good reason in my eyes. So um, I would uh, usually not separate them. Same with this. I know this argument to keep it free from all of the framework specific things and stuff like that. But in, in reality, it's just, you know, that's not a reason. Why? Because it literally never happened that we had to migrate some uh, persistent specific thing without actually rewriting the, the whole application or most of it anyway. So without making a big change where this actually did not, um, you know, did not influence it because the um, the, the motivation for this or the, the argument is always that you say, well, you can change the persistence without touching anything else. But yeah, in, in theory, that, that sounds nice, but in practice, it doesn't work like that. And it is much more effective actually just to put it into one model. Sometimes I put it even into one Java package and just these bunch of classes, uh, which are entities, which are you know persistent, which are um, business boundaries, like the entry point um, and whatever you have, and then just you know model it in this way. So this is uh, very pragmatic. And um, talking about sharing domain classes, that's also, I cannot recommend to do it from experience. It doesn't work. It's a very nice model to say, well, we have this different project that it can re reuse the same classes. Yeah, but in detail, it will fail because then you have slightly different even annotations or, you know, versions and Java versions. You're tangling everything together. It goes against the idea behind microservices also. So, um, no, keep it in one thing one thing per one application, uh, one um, Maven module, however you build it, and you'll be uh, more more happy, I claim. Um, and how would you use such a model in DDD model in a GraphDB like Neo4j? I have also an example for that. Neo4j Quarkus with a nice coffee shop example where I actually built this with um, Neo4j OGM on Quarkus. So, you know, that uses Quarkus, but whatever. But that also shows the modeling aspect uh, because the OGM, so that's basically like ORM, like JPA is on the relational side. Um, you know, you, you see, no, not that, um, also not that. It, it, you know, it's very similar and very close actually to um, the, the ideas behind this DDD modeling. And it, it works actually really well. So this is the example I, I have here. And how would you use it? Yeah, in such a way for Neo4j, for example. Um, would I use also this modeling approach? Yes, definitely. And especially with with the GraphDB, it is even easier because it is more closer to what we have in, in Java anyway. So we don't have to, you know, hammer it into this relational uh, tables. It is actually, you know, much more natural to keep all of these relations like we have references in, in Java. All right. So let's have a brief look into the chat. How can I, how can I get into Fang companies as a Java developer? Any uh, any thoughts? Well, I don't know if I'm in the, the the correct person um, to ask that. Um, I've seen that there are some resources out there for like blog posts and um, you know videos explain how to do. Um, I have to think what Fang again stands for. Google is there as well. Yes, Facebook, Amazon, Apple. N is, I guess, Netflix and Google um, about uh, into these companies as a, a tech person or as a Java developer. Um, it also depends a little bit what the company is doing. I know that Apple is actually, I don't know what they are doing, but I know they are hiring a lot of uh, Java uh, people uh, and Java advocates and, and around that uh, right now. So it might be there. There might be some uh, interesting aspects with Facebook. I actually am not sure because they do more on the, you know, either front end side or, or PHP traditionally. I'm not sure how much Java they have. Um, Amazon, yeah, definitely uh, as well. Netflix, definitely they have, they have, you know, bring this microservice uh, approach with Java big and, and Google, yeah, depends on the, uh, on the team as far as I know. Um, any thoughts? I would look into just um, whatever material you have into this uh, this whole interviewing aspect, right? Like how to crack the coding interview is one book I, uh, I know the title of. And, you know, there are a few aspects as with that and some 
um, I think once watched one of uh, two videos that actually explained, you know, how kind of the interviewing process works. So I think that's the nature of your question because that interviewing process is the biggest part in how to get into these uh, tech companies. And that's actually what I would what I would do. And any other thoughts, just in general, if you like technology and you, you know, maybe you like having a, a, a blog or something or creating your own videos or creating something open source in GitHub that you can share. From my, spect uh, from my perspective, that always helps because then these companies also see that you're not only enthusiastic somewhat about the uh, technology, but also, you know, that you like to share and they see some, um, you know, like uh, some experience there and that you qualify. So I think that would, you know, that's probably what, what I would do with just, you know, creating, trying to create the best, you know, uh, software developer out of yourself as, as you can do. But that's always a good, um, a good motivation, I would say, not just for the sake of getting such a job, uh, but yeah, then I would just give it a go. I mean, probably the best um, advice I would take is just, you know, just go for it. Because very often we we humans, we tend to, you know, then overthink and maybe hesitate because it's such a, you know, big goal and you're standing in front of that mountain and maybe you're anxious. I don't know, just say, okay, like I, I just try and, you know, the worst thing can happen that I failed and then I, uh, it's a good thing I learned a lot, right? So um, I would just go, go for it. Um, yeah so another ddd question do you reference other aggregates just by the ids or also through normal java references um the counter question where i mean in the java code it's it's java references definitely in the um if that's re regarded to the graph to be it would be references in the graph if it's related to um, relational database it's ids or like foreign keys but then it would be resolved typically with an oem uh, model so usually in the java code is java references i mean i would i would actually you know uh, say so uh because it's just much much easier and that's the whole purpose of uh, an ogm or oram approach um unless you have a specific uh, requirement uh for example you have to make a reference of an object that might not be uh it might not exist anymore something like a log or whatever and um, then you know it might make more sense to just keep the reference uh, to keep the id to not have an actual reference um, that you don't have to resolve anymore that's uh, or maybe you can uh, put something into to the chat again that i understand it correctly but in a java code it's always, always java references unless you have a really good reason all right google said golang good for microservice well yeah that's might be the case that google says it or the google results say that um, I, I cannot, that, that's too broad of a statement. I don't agree with that. Um, but CQRS, um, event sourcing domain driven design using many generic types, but Golang doesn't have a generic type. Yes, that Golang doesn't have a generic type is, is one limitation of it. And just in general, if you model something from a business perspective, I mean, again, I'm biased. Uh, don't trust me because I'm a Java person, but, uh, I think Java is just a, you know, a more mature language for it. And I would just, in general, as a recommendation, I would be just cautious if you say, well, uh, if you Google for the first result and it says, hey, it's good for that. But what does that mean? I mean, microservice, quote unquote, it is, it's a way of building an architecture. It doesn't say anything about the technology. If it would say Golang is good for um, command line um, based applications or something that, you know, is infrastructure with a high demand to, to hardware, then I would say, yes, that makes sense because of, you know, these native um uh, perspective and things like that, right? It, it's a different uh, approach. So uh, do I think Golang is just good for a small app? No. Also no, because um, if you look at Kubernetes uh, and things like that, it's, it's, you know, you can build very complex systems in it. So again, it's not, I, I wouldn't compare uh, programming languages in, in such a way that you say, you know, that's good for one category of things. I would look more into the specific requirements with regards to these things that make a language, you know, better suited or not that well suited for a specific um, use case. So that's how I would look into it. And I you know, wouldn't judge uh, that broadly and say, oh, this always needs to be used for that and this needs to be used for that. It's much more subtle than that. Um, yeah. Do you think that Java has its place in the future as a language for the backend? Yes. And uh, not, not only in the future, but also in the, in the past. And it's definitely here to stay. And again, I mean, it's easy when I say this as a Java person, but just from everything, everything I, I see from my perspective and, you know, the view of the ecosystem that I have, the front end has already disappeared. No more applets. Well, yeah, that's good. <laughs> the front end has disappeared. Yeah. Front end is just a difficult story because, you know, 
a lot of people are not super happy with uh, what JavaScript offers and it's still how some people say the best we have on the front end, you know, like because of browsers and stuff like that. That's the longer story. Uh, it's good that applets are not uh, not there. Uh, I mean, in the browser, that's that's a different thing. Um, but other than that, I mean, if you think of Android apps, then uh, with regards to front end, that's that's totally Java. So it really depends. And you know, there are also approaches with this Java FX, and you know, it's it's not that easy to answer. I would say, but for the defin uh, backend, definitely. I'm a certified OCP or Oracle certified professional, something like that, right? Um, I think it stands for, for Java 8. I've used this for one year and now it's Java 15. Last time I checked what have changed, Oracle major huge leap from Java 7 to 8. What about Java um, 8 and uh, to 15? Yeah, so uh, don't confuse the version numbers with uh, uh, with sizes of steps. I mean, that's due to now the faster nature of, uh, of Java. And um, I mean, you can have a look into um, I don't know what right now is the best resource. I would just actually like, you know, Google for some. There, there are always nice articles that literally show the, the different aspects of the um, uh, of the different versions and um, uh, with examples. So I would actually look into that. What I, but that's my, that's now my opinion. What I cannot recommend is to upgrade these, uh, these certifications each and every time because they are, um, from my perspective, if you have one, do you know that shows that you, you know are in this field? If you have that already, yes, then you know it's it's helpful to show your your profession. But it's not from my perspective not require it uh, required to update it each and every time there a new version comes out. Especially now because you know the version jumps uh, super fast um, for for the projects actually. So it you know it depends a little bit if if you if you have some experience that you find projects or a job much easier with that uh, certification then. Um, might be different, I guess, also from the area or the country where I live in. Uh, but that's that's my uh, my point on that. Um, does Oracle's Java documentation work well with Amazon uh, Coretta or OpenJDK? Um, depends what Oracle Java documentation is. If it's the Java language, yes, definitely, because it's uh, it's based on the same, like uh, Amazon Coretta, um, at least as far as I know, is also based on uh, OpenJDK. And OpenJDK is actually the golden source for all of these Java builds. The only thing that might be different is the, or is different, is the, is the JVM, like the runtime perspective from um, how it be, uh, might behave. So actually also not necessary to OpenJDK. I cannot comment on the uh, Amazon version, but if you, you know, if the JVM does things a little bit differently on, on that side, but um, for the documentation um, for Oracle, uh, no, uh, because you know, it, it is the same Java it's been built and especially not from the language perspective because that's uh, defined in the language uh, specification. So we have really a lot of questions today, but I think that's super cool. I'm really happy about that. So um, as long as you don't get tired that quickly, I, I definitely uh, like this. So I just continue answering stuff. Um, let's jump back to the GitHub issues. By email regarding this undo feature, so I made a video on how to uh, implement an undo feature with a Neo for J database, which is quite interesting. So you know, um, actually, I can have a look into it if you uh, if you're interested. What it does, it actually comes with a um, plugin that you run on the database side. Why on a database side? Because then you have capabilities for uh, CDC change data capture, which the database has much more or easier all of the information that you need as opposed to the application side. So then what it will do, it will create uh, certain nodes that actually contain such a change data capture in JSON in my case, and which you can actually actively use later on from the application perspective. Um, so I found that super interesting. Um, feel free to uh, to watch that. The question was, um, I have a production app that uses Neo4j and Spring data. Um, SDN was Spring data nodes, or I don't know. It was the Neo4, Spring data Neo4j, I think something like that. It was basically Neo4j support for Spring, which is um, more mature than what I showed here. I used uh, Quarkus. So it's more mature than the, the Quarkus approach, actually. So the question was, is it possible to use that with um, Spring? Yes, it is. Um, definitely, because what I'm using here, most of it or half of it is actually just on the plugin side, which means it is a plugin that you run on your Neo4j instance, which actually doesn't care if you use Quarkus or Spring or something else to connect to it. 
and the other half is just your application to you can check out the code if you want um, to literally you know no load uh, such an action node with the CDC and then apply it again but the application part or the application of it that I wrote is um, I think even plain uh, Neo4j Java it's not even OGM or something like that but even OGM that's that's supported uh, so answer yes you can definitely use that approach um, probably have to rewrite the code a little bit that I, these code examples because it's Quarkus uh, but you can definitely use the same approach uh, on that application side. I found that interesting. Maybe you want to have a look into it. All right. And still you have to write into the chat where you're actually watching from today. Or for me, it's uh, evening already. I'm in uh, Vienna right now, so European uh, time zone. Which is why this is actually uh, not coffee, but, but tea uh, at this time of the day. It's easier. And another question regarding effective testing. Yes, I love the topic of testing. I think that's an interesting one. Due to the separation of integration system tests into the uh, separate project, yes, that's something I uh, like to do, not to get some accidental reuse of, uh, of stuff. So if I have a system test um, um, project that is separated from my production code, so it deliberately doesn't reuse production code, how to get correct code quality measurements from uh, Sonar. Yes, that is a thing. So Sonar now thinks that the code coverage is low because now if you run the test, like either, you know, it's not connected to the code or you in your project, you only have, you know, a few code level tests like unit tests or uh, some component tests and the system tests are not taken into account because they're disconnected. What you can do, which is actually a much better approach, is that you use um, your code um, uh, a code coverage measurement tool, typically Jacoco, I guess, and let it run on the server side while you run your system test um, environment. So in your system test environment, your application runs in the same way or a very similar way, like in production. And what you can do, Jacoco has an agent, a Java agent that actually runs on your production or you know kind of production system test application. And then when you run the system test, it actually shows the code coverage. So it basically only does the coverage on the production side, which paths have been uh, executed. And then at the end, um, you get the results from there. How this works is as follows that you have, where is it? So Jacoco, I'm showing this, this is what's mostly being used, but it's definitely, you know, it's integrated with Sonar and it's a very nice tool um, that you can use as an agent. So documentation looks a little bit old fashioned. Uh, a Java agent, which means you um, have a Jococo agent that runs in your production app. So you run that on the production side, has no connection to a source or whatever. And then this gathers all of the data of what has been covered in a specific test run, or in your case, since application startup or whatever. And then afterwards in your uh, pipeline, what it can do is have a look uh, into how the coverage is. So why is that a much better approach? Well, if you do a code level test, like a code level integration test, then the coverage doesn't say that much because you're still running your application in a different way like you would uh, in production, right? But with that, uh, with this approach, what you do, two things. First of all, you have a very good coverage of your system test. So basically, you know, run application in production with the Java agent and then from the outside afterwards, fire the system test and then see which code paths, production code paths have been executed and then get this in the uh, information in the next next state of the uh, of your pipeline. So you can automate all of it, right? Like automate, deploy my system test app with the Java agent, the next step, f uh, run the system test, the next step, you know, tear it down again and get the information of the coverage and then look into the coverage of your system tests. Two things you get. First of all, you get the coverage of your test, what is actually covered. Second, you see how good your t system test scenarios are because when something is not covered, either you better write some system tests for it because then you have some paths that are not executed or you have dead code. So it's actually a very good hack to identify like actual dead, uh, dead code, like, you know, code that might be behind an endpoint or whatever, but maybe that end endpoint is totally um, forgotten and lost and nobody, you know, uh, remembers about it anymore. And actually it's not required. Um, or again, you know, you better improve your test hardness. So it is actually very, I, I really like this approach because it's a very pragmatic approach to get, get really good insights about your test scenario. 
So you see how good your system tests are and at the same time you see on the production code, hey, what is actually being executed for these test scenarios that I'm running. So that is something I would uh, recommend uh, there. And again, it's, you know, I think really a really nice uh, approach for that. All right. And uh, via email, um, been working as a front-end developer for a few years and last year I decided to invest time studying back-end development more seriously and my language of choice is Java. Thumbs up, I like that. Uh, what advice would you give to your younger self when you started uh, studying Java and back-end development? Yeah, so I actually thought about like um, w w what best to answer it as a, you know, a few things uh, that I was uh, thinking uh, thinking about uh, to answer. So first of all, backend development I always found interesting because of you know all of these lower level details things like database transaction uh, connections uh, things like that. I'm actually not a very graphical uh, type of person. I love the command line, and I mean you've seen before my Linux setup, right? So it's uh, that's actually what I what I enjoy, and for me that's just more uh, productive. The first advice I would give is to not run away from confusion when you're you know confused by something when you don't understand something but actually run towards it like try to understand it for example from the back end side for me that in the beginning was database transactions like how does this even work how does the database you know is communicated with how do transactions work how does the database make sure that the whole thing is consistent and stuff like that uh, same with http connections um, and all of these kind of basics quote unquote and these basics actually haven't changed for you know, decades. And um, that actually helps a lot just to, you know, understand. And you can always ask yourself that question, hey, did I really understand it? Like, is there still some tiny question mark in my head? Uh, same, we talked about CQRS before. So I was struggling with, you know, how does this even work? How can I make sure that everything there stays consistent eventually, things like that? Um, then try look into it, like just, you know, try to focus on the things that actually give you confusion, because these are these are the entry points that, you know, advance you further. So don't run away and say, oh, yeah, I kind of am not understanding it, but, you know, um, brush it off or something like that and just ignore it. No, it's actually really helpful to look into these things and not necessarily because you have to use them in the same way. Like you say, for example, well, I have to become the expert into databases and do some lower level database stuff. No, that's not the, that's not the point. It's about understanding and still being able to use the pragmatic, easy, easy approach provided by a framework. So these two things are separate. Um, I can share a story from my mm, computer science studies. In the first semester, actually, we had a um, we had a course on, it was called technical uh, computer science, basically hardware, but really low level, you know, logical gates and these silicium um, chips and uh, not silicium, uh, silicon. <laughs> Uh, chips and things like that, you know, like logical gates, like AND gates and OR gates, XOR, and how to build them together. And then in one practical exercise, we had to build literally a microcontroller, like a small computer, in including a tiny bit of RAM and things like that, and code um, only in binary, some, you know, hex format um, comments, uh, commands, like um, a very, very basic assembler, and then just execute, let it execute step by step, very slowly, very basic. Why I liked it was, I mean, nobody of us wanted to go into this hardware space. I mean, we wanted to be you know, kind of software developers, uh, but it helped a lot bridging that gap of the understanding, like how does it work internally? How do I get from these hardware and from the you know flying electrons to actually that my computer can execute code? And for me, that really clicked because um, then if you understand, you don't have to be an expert in it, but just if you understand how it works, in theory, then you bridge that gap and you say, okay, now I get the whole picture. And then you see, okay, there is the, you know, physical hardware. And with all of these steps, even if you're not an expert in de detail or whatever, you kind of know how the whole picture f comes together. So this was really helpful in understanding. And at the same time, acknowledging that you don't have to be an expert on that and you don't even have to touch it ever again. Same with these database transactions, please don't write them yourself, you know, use an ORM framework. But if you know what it does under the hood, this is really, really helpful. Um, so for me, I would say this is probably the advice uh, that I would give a younger version of myself. And the other advice is definitely um, try to keep the coding turnaround times low. 
try to get fast feedback. I specifically say this for backend because um, in the backend system, you know, when, when I started uh, with you know J2EE back then servers and Java E servers, they were super slow in reloading and it was always, you know, killing your flow experience, right? You make some change and then you have to wait for some minutes until that damn thing started again. And it kicks you out of the flow experience. You know, you do something, you're thinking about it, and then it's like, oh, wait. And then, of course, we, we humans, we get distracted. We want to check whatever uh, emails. We want to look at Slack and Twitter. And, um, you know, the longer you can stay in this flow experience by trying to craft an environment where you actually get super fast feedback, this really, really helps. Um, maybe you want to check out this effective testing uh, course because there I'm showing how to do this with tests. So that you say, I have a system test scenario where my um, system test is always running. Um, uh, sorry, the, the environment is always running. The application is always running with a hot reload approach. And then I just, you know, change some code, save, and it will reload immediately. And I can run the test immediately and it gets super fast feedback. And within two, three, five uh, seconds, I have feedback. I can say, you know, write something, check it. Okay, green. Write something again, green. And if you do that, you'll be so much, not only so much faster and more effective, but it's also so much more joy and you learn much faster. So I would earlier look into these things. How can I make my actual coding while I'm sitting there in my coding session, while I'm on the keyboard, uh, more ef uh, effective by just getting these low turnaround times. Really get impatient on purpose. Say, if something takes five seconds, 10 seconds, that's too slow. How can I get it faster? Is there a trick to you know make it, uh, make it more effective? And uh, then I would, uh, would take it from there. And that's definitely the, the advice I would give a, uh, a younger self. And yeah, I hope that's, that's helpful. Mm. All right, have a look at the chat. Hi, Sebastian, when do you recommend Java E over Spring Framework? When I recommend it uh, nowadays, because they're, you know, so I don't want to say similar. Um, Mostly, I say, uh, depends on which APIs you're more familiar with or the team is more familiar with. There's one um, approach when I definitely recommend, uh, like Java E, quote unquote, Quarkus um, over Spring or, you know, the Java E APIs, which are now Jakarta APIs or in general, uh, Quarkus. Why? Because it's a really nice way of implementing this idea of uh, of an enterprise Java runtime with containers in mind. And um, my, my thoughts on Quarkus here specifically are uh, you can compile it down to native code with the scroll VM, what I mentioned before, but that's actually not the point. The point is it does the, all the optimization for your runtime at build time. So it has a really nice, you know, build uh, mechanism. Uh, you know, it, it has really good guides. It shows you how to get started with that. Um, but it has a build mechanism with Maven that you can build your application actually quite quickly. And when you start it up, it's already super optimized. It doesn't have to start up like back then your application server would, what I just mentioned, and, you know, wire everything together and search for, oh, what do we have there? No, it's already ready. And with that, it's super fast. Even just with a plain JVM, I actually always run it with uh, in a JVM mode. And uh, with that, this is a really nice approach and it's really, you know, effective. The developer experience is really, uh, really awesome for that. So I'm, I'm a big fan. Plus, um, it actually uses uh, APIs that developers are familiar with. So I'm super happy that it didn't try to reinvent the wheel again, you know, write the, I don't know how many um, REST frameworks we already have and write yet another API. I mean, for which purpose, right? And it reuses you know, Java EE APIs plus others, like it has JAXRS, CDI support, JPA and all these uh, things. And that, that's really, really cool. So I'm a big fan of that. And actually now, but you know, I'm a person with an EE background. Uh, I now always uh, used, well, not always, but most of the time use that. Um, and, but uh, that would be what I would uh, advise for, you know, new project or for this perspective. And other than that, it really depends. So if you're for example, you have an application, an existing application that runs on, let's say, um, some uh, WebSphere or Liberty, for example, then you might want to look into WebSphere uh, Liberty or Open Liberty, which is also actually a very modern and nice approach because then your modernization might be easier, right? If you go, you know, it's not that big of a jump. And again, the APIs that your team is familiar with or that yourself are familiar with. So it depends on a, uh, on a few thing, things. Okay, India. Yeah, hi to India. Uh, question from Berlin, Germany. Cool. 
when are you going to build yourself a dactyl keyboard? I cannot take you seriously of being about effective developer uh, without using one of those. So, okay, you will now take me even less seriously. Dactyl keyboard. I specific, I heard the name. Oh, this one, yeah. I even have to search what it is. So here, uh, one of these. Yes. Okay, so you can take, not take me seriously without this. So one thing I, and I actually made a video about that, uh, which I'm using now is, it's, it's not the same, I know. It goes into the direction and I'm actually very happy about that. So just recently you can uh, look at my YouTube channel. I have a, uh, my thoughts on about that. I have a video about it. Why? Because it has these extra keys. So that's pretty cool. What uh, you're suggesting is, well, it's more ergonomic. I, I get that. And as far as I see, they also have more uh, more keys, which really makes sense. So for example, that's also what I like about this keyboard. Your thumb is actually much more flexible and you know powerful than uh, all your other fingers. So it should you know have more to do than just the boring space bar, um, which also you know is the case here with these extra modifier keys. So that's definitely cool. I actually am quite happy from the ergonomic perspective. So I would be interested in, in your thoughts if you say, okay, it's super cool with these hundreds of keys. Well, probably not that many more, right? I mean, the thumb definitely is, you know, um, more has more work to do, which is good. But for the other keys, that's also, also with that keyboard. It comes with a split layout and, you know, it's nice. I, I use it, but I... Um, um, you know, I'm, I was even quite happy with the strict layout. So I'm, I'm not really missing that. I would say just the fact that you get a good mechanical keyboard is more important, like the actual keys with the click, um, you know, uh, typing experience than the, the, the form factor um, was not totally serious. Yeah, but no, you absolutely, uh, you actually, you're right. Because um, I always say we, we spend so much time on these things, uh, typing. That's also the, um, the reason why I say get a proper keyboard. And it really makes sense to think about it, right? Because the, the long-term investment is like super, super high if you just make a tiny improvement because we, we spend so much time typing. So yeah, you know, I, I know you were probably halfly joking, but I, I think it's actually a really important point to say if you're just a little bit uh, better and it might be subjective that you say, hey, for my fingers or whatever, <laughs> um, I'm just more happy on this keyboard, then please use it really and spend some time looking into it. What is the best setup uh, for me? Um, so also in, in this video that I recorded recently, I said you might already or you will already have some specific muscle memory in your fingers. So for example, if you used a laptop where, I don't know, left alt is like here or where left alt is like there, then you will be happier with a different keyboard than, than others, right? Because when, when you try to hit alt, then you, you, know, you do this instead of that. And these are just tiny muscle memory movements that we do. And it's actually, I find it very interesting to look into that and to say, well, how can I make some, some investment that actually really pays off in the long run because we spend so much time uh, typing. So that's definitely, um, yeah, definitely interesting. <laughs> um, it also has uh, QMK, which enables many really cool features. I got the light, light cycle edition, has less keys, but not a problem with QMK. Uh, I got shift on V and M, uh, for example. Wow, okay, that's, that, that's really... Uh, a uh, really cool, cool QMK keyboard. It's also, I, I learn a lot today uh, here. Quantum mechanical keyboard, okay. Interesting, super cool. And we have another question. How much does the creation of one API cost? For example, one post API, how should I price the apps that I built? Wow, okay, that's a, um, a different uh, topic because I would not, well, it depends. It depends on the type of, uh, of project. If you, for example, do freelance work, uh, something like that, how you want to uh, build up your, um, uh, your, your billing or, you know, your, your building st uh, billing structure or your cost uh, structure for, uh, for, your, uh, for your customers. If you say, you know, you build per deliverable, whatever that means, you say, for example, for endpoint, API endpoint, because usually the API uh, post, like HTTP post, that that is not the problem, right? Like, I mean, I, I can write you an HTTP post uh, in, in 20 seconds, that does nothing. <laughs> but then, you know, the, the question is what it does on the on the backend side. So, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm always curious about pricing models, but I don't know if that is the correct um, way to think about it, unless you actually know the project really well. If you say, hey, I know that it's gonna be an HTTP post, whatever, that hits the database and I can write it in, in a few hours or in a few minutes or something, then you know if you know really what you're pricing for uh, then you can do that um, 
you, you can do it in you know in a uh, in a very certain or straightforward way how much it costs that you know you cannot say this in, in the straightforward way that you say you know so and so many uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of dollars for one api call because it really depends first of all what's what's behind it you know how much effort it is but also what i like to think about it from that um being self-employed uh, or from a, a self-employed perspective uh, is um is how much value are you adding to uh to the customer so um it's not only you know if, if they have this application and they make uh, tons of money out of it and then you can say well actually you know for you it's very valuable um you know to implement that other than that i i would always or in the past i I would start up with something like an hourly rate to say, okay, what is your hourly rate? And then maybe use this as a, you know, base baseline to say, okay, it will take me so and so many um, hours or minutes or whatever to implement that fully fledged feature. And then, you know, try to take it from there. But I wouldn't even specifically look at it from API perspective, more from functionality perspective, right? Because HTTP post, that's just, you know, that's just the first starting point. But what happens on the uh, on the other end, that's that's more interesting, and the user you typically also, or the customer or whoever you're talking to, also cares about it, right? Because they don't care. Well, HTTP post could also be something else, whatever, right? But what happens on the backend side? So I think that's the interesting part, and then you know just take it from there in order to do kind of this. But yeah, pricing can be uh, challenging sometimes. I, I it, it just I found it interesting to think of it from a perspective: how much value do you add? You know how much valuable it is for the for the customer and then then see it from there uh, but most developers actually and um, I'm the same myself like would actually be charged not not enough because we're more like what's the right way introvert or anxious and say oh is it you know is it really you know nice to say such a price or whatever then actually the value that a lot of developers bring right because if, if the client has a lot of value out of it then you know why why not charge for that, right? But that's a totally different topic. But I, I hope um, that was helpful. No, yes, I'm on a project that's already 400 API calls, um, I, uh, I think. But with that, I really, sorry, I cannot comment better on this because it really depends what's what's behind it, right? I wouldn't actually think of it from an API perspective, but really what's uh, what what the whole um, effort brings into, right? Like what you actually have to do also on the on the backend part. All right, so wow, we spend a lot of time uh, today already, and I'm actually very, very happy. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for for watching, uh, watching live. Let me actually refresh the issues here again. If we have something new, no, we think um, covered uh, all of the questions here. I think we covered uh, all of the questions uh, in the chat uh, for now as well. If you have some other question and just want to say hi, please post, uh, post it into uh, the chat as well. And because there's always a you know a slight delay from uh, from the streaming. And also, I actually have a question uh, to you whether you would be interested, and I mean just in uh, uh, in general, to have some some type of uh, live coding at these type of live uh, Q and A sessions. Uh, because I thought, well, I, I have to, um, you know, prepare a lot of, you know, code examples that I do for my presentations as part of my job and things like that. So now I'm planning, you know, to have a little bit more on testing. So would you be interested in just, you know, watching while that is being created? And I mean, literally created like, like I did today when I don't know something, okay, I have to Google it, like literally nothing, not a prepared presentation, like something polished already, but literally say, okay, this is me just Let's take a coffee, sit down and figure this out, how this works. And then, you know, we can have a chat or, you know, if you watch me do certain things, because I, I sometimes got the comment when people were watching uh, me coding with, you know, these aliases and all these shortcuts and whatever. They're like, wow, that's cool. How you do this? And I'm like, oh, uh, this, yeah, actually here, this, that, that shortcut or something like that. So if you um, be interested in that, um, yeah, let me know. Actually, you can just type it into the chat because I really don't know, but I think I will just try it out maybe, you know, once per week or something like that. Just a coding with Sebastian session on probably Java or whatever we find. And then you can sure uh, you can uh, surely join and just comment and whatever. So some people say, yes, sure. Okay, that's cool. I'm happy. So let's try this out. We have one more question. Have you used Socket API JE in a real project? If yes, how it was used today? Uh, Socket, uh, I now have to think, do you mean WebSocket? WebSockets, yes. Uh, Socket API, let me just quickly Google if there is another one because 
a plain socket, I mean Java sockets, uh, like network socket. Um, probably not, I mean sometimes for, uh, for uh, lower level stuff like input streams, but I think, I hope you mean web sockets. Web sockets, yes, and it was actually um, exactly this, like the Java E for web socket API that came in uh, Java E7. Um, yes, I. what do we use it for? Actually, multiple things, basically uh, real-time client connection back and forth, where also the client sends something back to the server and, you know, without a request response model, more like the, you know, the, the connection uh, model. And th that was really uh, they were helpful, yes. So it's, you know, not as straightforward uh, to use as, uh, for example, JAXRS or service and event, uh, but uh, it is definitely, you know, definitely usable also from a, a client uh, perspective. Uh, I mean, Java clients, you can also use that on the client side. And yeah, WebSocket, okay, cool. Would be great to see you Google some simple stuff like we do. Yes, really, trust me. I mean, we're all developers. We all have to figure out something. I mean, you ask me a question about what well, was it, these uh, all kinds of things like keyboards and I've never heard this or this testing uh, framework, I already forgot the name and you know what to do. If you never heard of it, well, you can't know anything, but then the, the question is also, it might be helpful to see, okay, what is the way of working, especially if you're not there already, right? It's very easy to put out a polished and, and totally perfect uh, presentation or whatever and people were like, wow, but you know, how to get there even and I think that it might be helpful. Okay, so some more comments. Let me just quickly catch up with the comments. Can we sw uh, hot swap Java class as runtime? Yes. Um, a best feature to look into uh, IntelliJ debug. Debug with a uh, feature with hot swapping classes. That works really, really well. Um, with with Quarkus, that actually that's what happens, or it actually swaps the whole application if you do the the live uh, live uh, not live demo live development uh, approach. Awesome. Since software is everywhere nowadays, what's your take on professionalism among software developers? Well, yeah, that's, there is a, I think that's a, that's a longer topic on its own. Uh, there has been interesting talk that I listened to on basically like uh, professionalism in terms of how software is affecting everything and all of our lives and safety. And, you know, if you think on airplanes and stuff like that, um, yeah, I mean, testing, <laughs> Uh, I guess, or uh, just in general, try to be more considerate. Actually, I don't know if I can answer it in in uh, in, in, in in such a short time because it it covers multiple things in terms of professionalism. Not only you know the safety aspects. If you have something that at some point gets in get in touch with people's lives, um, it might not even be something as crazy as an airplane or whatever. But you know, you get there quite quickly uh, with regards to testing, with regards to making it uh, safe, but also from a data perspective to be, there's a beautiful German uh, word, uh, Datensparsamkeit, <laughs> to be like basically trying to, um, not save data, but basically trying to avoid um, persisting data that you don't really need, like trying to be as effect effective with having as little data as possible um, and collecting data from your users and all of that stuff. And data is also very valuable. So it's sometimes, you know, a that's actually from a uh, developer perspective can be quite a moral conflict to say, well, it would be cool to gather all the data right from the user and it's super valuable for us. But actually, so what I try to think of it often in terms of professionalism is to say, if I were the user of the, that software, sometimes I am, what would I like to have? Like how it reacts, how well it is tested, how a feature works, and especially how it uses my data, right? Really trying to say, if, okay, if I had a say as a user from really trying to ignore all the other perspectives for a second, look at it and say, okay, what is the best way, right? Some people say, what would person X do? What would, I don't know, what would professional put in your, your name, Sebastian Dashner developer do if, I, we, if we would live in a perfect world? Just to maybe live a little bit up to that ideal, especially with you know these questions that are really, really important. So it's, it's a really, really good question. Um, with that, sometimes I like to think of it from that perspective to say, if, if I would be the affected person by that, how would I like it to be? And then really don't be afraid also to speak up. I know that's super challenging and, you know, in a team or if your manager says, I, you know, just use this feature and do that. Um, but if you say, Hey, sorry, we should not do that. And I actually don't want to implement it for you. And actually we have much more power over managers and other people uh, than we sometimes realize, right? Because they cannot program like we we are the ones to implement it. And if actually your name is afterwards uh, on it, I mean, with 
uh, Volkswagen and all these, you know, scandals. There actually there were developers who went, who went to jail because they also have some uh, responsibility there. So that's a whole topic on its own. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not much related to Java, but where can I find good documentation, audio, decoding and encoding? I mean, programming something for, say, streaming audio and so on. Honest answer, I don't know. I would Google it. I mean, that's what I would do. Um, what I would look into a good documentation is, I mean, again, I've never, actually, I've never done audio. I mean, I can say there's a few things I sometimes do, but audio is like, I don't even know how the, there's a Java audio or a Java sound API. I don't even know how it works. What I would look into it uh, were code would be codecs first, like just to see, okay, what you're actually trying to do. I would look into streaming um, um, communication protocols, or what's supported there, and then I would look for technology support, like what your language of choice is and to see how to do certain things. That's how I would get started into it for streaming audio and these things. But other than that, I, I don't know. Where did you study coding and for how long? I st Well, I studied computer science uh, in Munich as a just you know like regular students like regular computer science but i um actually for even before many years before actually so i started very early even as you know a pupil back in in school just at the side to work as in some like agencies like internet uh, service uh not internet service providers but like internet agencies doing websites and doing some backend systems so i got into this uh very very early and just you know doing hands-on stuff for for customers super early for first of all, it was websites with some web development uh, ages ago. And uh, then, you know, more on the back end side, more and more starting doing more and more Java. And then uh, my studies came. Uh, Java was the language of choice uh, for the whole studies, actually. And then that's how I ended up. And um, I went to uh, be self-employed and a consultant uh, immediately after my studies, which some people thought it's, it's crazy. And now I'm a developer advocate uh, with IBM because I love uh, sharing knowledge and just you know teaching others what I know about enterprise software and yeah that's in a very nutshell my uh, my studies and, and since then do enterprise Java developers implement their own HTTP server or do they use Apache HTTP nginx or something else enterprise Java developers or their own HTTP server well definitely no usually not because it's not not worth the effort um, Apache or Nginx, yes, if you have content only, um, you know, that's more actually on the infrastructure side or running containers or whatever. I would do that if you really have no other Java, you know, or backend, um, uh, backend mechanism, because if you only need that, yes, of course, take something off the shelf. If you have a little bit of Java code, then I actually would use, and I've done that a few times, just an um, enterprise uh, backend, like, you know, something powered by Open Liberty, powered by Quarkus, and deliver all of your artifacts from that server and just use it somewhat as a web server because it's very pragmatic and they are fast enough. That's totally fine. Or yes, use, I, I actually use Nginx a few times. It's, it's very pragmatic and I like it. I like Nginx a little bit more than Apache just because of the, the layout of the configuration files. I think that's crazy in Apache with this sort of uh, XML syntax, but not really. Or well, I don't know if it changed nowadays, but it was like that. And with Nginx, I've, I've been super happy. So that's also sometimes what I'm using. It depends a little bit on the uh, on the use case. If you have only delivery content delivery stuff, then then yes. Netflix has some open source stuff on streaming uh, audio quality. Okay, um, that's cool. Audio and video. Yeah, just uh, there you go. Just ask uh, for the questions and you get some answers. But also with audio, I don't know. Okay, cool. Wow, we have a lot of questions today. That's super awesome. Uh, I always try to schedule these for 45 minutes, but now we're one and a half hours, which is cool. I really like that you're so engaged and that you're asking questions. Um, but with that, I would actually cut it uh, here. And um, yeah, I'm really, really happy that you joined uh, me on this live Q&A session. And um, especially if you have some more uh, questions or anything, I would just like to cut it now, just put it into uh, you know, to the issue I have or ask it uh, next time. And I will keep you updated about this live coding session. I want to try this out and feel free to join again, maybe in exactly a week, I don't know, let's see. And because uh, the timing would, would work for me. And yeah, I really hope uh, you're doing well in all these uh, crazy times and then you can spend the time focus on programming. That's, that's what I do because it's a very nice uh, just activity of building stuff 
and yeah use the time to improve uh, your skills and learning new things that's always good and yeah i hope this this was just interesting to watch and i wish you a very nice evening or day or in which time zone uh, you are and yeah hopefully see you soon thanks for watching bye